Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Center for National Security and Cooperation at Stanford University and our weekly research seminar. My name is Harold Rincunas. I'm the deputy director here at the center. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speakers today who will be speaking on their project, How Global is the Global Far Right? Uh, these are uh, three longtime colleagues. We're very happy to welcome them back to uh, Stanford. Uh, let me start by introducing uh, Professor uh, Martha Crenshaw, who's a senior fellow emerita at the Center for National Security and Cooperation here at Stanford, also a professor emerita at the Department of Government at Wesleyan University and the director of the Mapping Militants Project, currently supported by NCIT or Insight. Uh, but the, uh, our next two speakers are Dr. Iris Malone, who is an assistant professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. She focuses on the causes of terrorism and insurgency as she conducts research on threat assessment, conflict forecasting, and state-sponsored terrorism. And Dr. Kate, Caitlin Robinson uh, is an America in the World Consortium postdoctoral fellow at Duke University. Her research examines how international and organizational politics influence civil war. She has been a researcher in the Mapping Militants Project, and she will be joining Rice University as an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science in the fall. Uh, welcome to all three of you. Uh, just as a reminder to the audience, uh, we'll take have a Q&A period after the talk. If you're online, please enter your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom. And if you're here in the audience, one finger to get on the queue, two fingers to jump the queue to speak to the matter immediately at hand. Uh, over to you, Martha. make the presentation here. This is part of the Mapping Militants Project that's been ongoing here at CSAC since 2010, I think. So we're over a decade into this research. Originally, we worked on foreign terrorist organizations, uh, primarily Islamist groups most recently. And we recently expanded our attention to the far right in the US and globally with the support of the Department of Homeland Security through the Insight Consortium. However, of course, nothing that we say should be construed as representing the point of view of DHS or any other government agency. So we're really pleased to be here. It's nice to be back and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Iris and Katie at this point. All right, thank you everyone so much for coming today. We're excited to present some of the conceptualization and kind of data collection work we've been doing with the Mapping Militants Project uh, that is focused on the global far right. And so in this piece of the project, we're thinking about how global actually is this global far right? How connected are these individual elements? So we start here with uh, you know, the fact that I'm sure a lot of people in this room agree with that the far right poses a major threat inside the United States. So this is most obviously shown uh, by the January 6th attack, uh, but also many other recent attacks. Uh, for example, the plot to kidnap uh, the Michigan governor by an anti-government militia. Uh, additionally, uh, a lot of white supremacists or racially motivated violent extremist groups uh, that have been planning and carrying out attacks in the United States for past decades. Uh, in a 2021 report from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, they assessed that these two types of domestic extremist threats, the anti-government uh, uh, militias and the racially motivated violent extremists, pose some of the most lethal domestic uh, violent extremist threats in the United States. So this is not just happening in the US. This is happening everywhere. Uh, some recent examples include uh, the uh, plot that was just disrupted in Germany, uh, UK uh, worries about uh, domestic radicalization and the recruitment uh, to various white supremacist groups. And then you know, just within the last week, people are drawing connections between the far right in the United States and the far right in Brazil and the storming of their Congress. So the questions we try to answer in this project is first, how connected is this broader movement? And we've seen examples of this. Uh, for example, uh, a California uh, synagogue attack was connected to the New Zealand Christchurch attack. And so we see kinds of like inspirations, ideas spreading, but are there actually formal ties between these different groups and these different actors? 
a second question that we're interested in asking uh, is what can governments then do about these broader connections? So again, we've seen governments try to start figuring this out. Uh, we saw Canada designate a variety of US domestic extremist groups as terrorist organizations, including the Proud Boys. And so a question we might ask is, are, is do these conventional uh, counterterrorism techniques actually undermine the far right threat, uh, particularly because they're developed to uh, combat an Islamic kind of extremist international threat. And so how well do those tools fit to this problem? So in the talk today, uh, we'll be focusing again on this kind of broader conceptualization. Uh, so uh, we'll describe our process for collecting data on the global far right and their ties to different organizations. Uh, but then we're also gonna spend a lot of time going through the different challenges we've encountered in this work. And we'd welcome your feedback or suggestions on how we should think about overcoming those challenges. Um, then we'll try to kind of apply our network uh, structuring to the Islamic State, but also to the far right. So you can kind of see the differences between the two types of networks start to pop out. And concluding thoughts, uh, we'll wrap up with kind of our starting assessment about how global the global far right actually is, and then some uh, places we'd like to move forward in the future. So how do we measure, analyze, and track this threat posed by the global far right? So the work that we've been doing with Martha uh, for the past several years, started in uh, July 2020, uh, we started receiving funding from the National Counterterrorism Innovation Technology and Education Center, which is NSITE. Um, and so that, that money was coming from Homeland Security, and they wanted us to look at uh, whether or not the far right elements in the United States were tied to other far right elements uh, around the world. And so as part of the Mapping Militants project, we've kind of traditionally taken two approaches to studying militant organizations. The first is to write uh, comprehensive narratives of each group. Uh, so these are screenshots of the page for the Russian Imperial Movement, which is a white supremacist group based in Russia. Um, and we uh, identify how the group was formed, how it developed over time, and then its connections to other organizations. So since starting this project, we've uh, written full profiles for about 15 of these far right groups, uh, including a variety of ideologies such as the anti-government groups, the accelerationist groups, and the white supremacist groups. Then we take kind of those 15 core groups and we plot their relationships to other groups uh, in the far right movement. So this here is uh, the map. It's kind of like a family tree that we created for all the different connections between the groups, um, their allies, their rivals, affiliates, uh, splinters, et cetera. So we've been working on hopefully a new website coming out soon. <laughs> to show this in kind of a better way. Uh, so this is kind of hard to read, it's a little clunky. Um, and we'll show you some screenshots of those new visualizations that we're working on later in this presentation. So up to Iris, you know. Say green. Oh, now it's red and green. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so as Katie methodological and conceptualization challenges that we've been navigating as we try to assess uh, kind of the, the, the far right network. And I would note overall that studying the far right is an incredibly challenging issue because it represents a highly complex and unpredictable uh, 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 set of, of extremists. And this creates first off a, a unit of analysis challenge in trying to determine who is the far right? What are the different entities that we actually want to study in this? And we know that this is a challenge for a few different reasons. So first we note that a lot of far right actors actually operate very differently from conventional terrorist or extremist organizations, that they are often very open, even braggadocious um, about their philosophical beliefs and their kind of intent to use violence rather than the more conventional clandestine cell-based networks that we might find in say uh, more, more jihadist uh, networks. A second challenge is the emphasis on the decentralized organization. So famously, Louis Beam in the early 1990s kind of championed uh, the white supremacist use of leaderless resistance structures, which called for individuals to kind of act out on their own, uh, encouraged by this overarching belief in, in kind of a common end goal. Um, and that this decentralized organization then creates different attribution challenges, which then creates kind of the third unit of analysis problem, which is the membership question. Who counts as an extremist? We note that 
One of the big problems is this fluidity of membership that anyone can often self identify with a set of far right beliefs or even uh, assign themselves membership in multiple organizations. So, for example, Patriot Prayer, which is a a uh, small far right group uh, based out of Portland also had several members that nationally identified with the Proud Boys organization. And we call this kind of fluid membership challenge and an entanglement problem because it makes it very hard to discern whether an individual is acting on behalf of one type of organization, another uh, organization, or is operating entirely independently. Beyond the organizational challenges, we also note that there are issues identifying what counts as an act of far right extremism. That oftentimes these extremists, because of their open and public facing nature, engage in tactics that are often nonviolent, even, even legal. For example, in 2020, we often saw members of the Boogaloo Boys or the Proud Boys showing up at BLM protests, uh, ostensibly in, in the name of like creating uh, law and order or, or safety, um, that similarly, they are often not explicitly using violence and kind of going out and staging mass casualty attacks the way we've seen other extremist organizations act, but are instead uh, aiming to create an atmosphere of intimidation or to provoke some type of retaliatory response from uh, either far left or other types of organizations. And so overall, kind of this makes it challenging to determine who we should include as actors on the map. Another challenge though, is kind of what, what do we actually wanna study? What do we mean by thinking about how to measure ties? So for a long time, the Mapping Militants Project was interested in kind of measuring formal connections between different entities, by which we often meant group to group interactions in which we saw some type of sharing of say materials or intelligence or ideological uh, beliefs. But instead, when we think about the far right, we're at this current stage thinking more about a spectrum of different relationships that we're trying to kind of sort out. And we would say that this spectrum is kind of punctuated by a few different questions. So first is what is the motive behind the tie or the relationship? So why would two entities be interested in interacting with each other? Is it ideological, is it doctrinal? Uh, second is the formality of the connection. So how are these interactions and ties coming about? Is there a major difference between uh, uh, deliberate versus organic uh, interactions? And third uh, is the medium. So where are these interactions taking place? So to give you kind of a sense then of how we've been thinking about this, we have here kind of three stylized examples that demonstrate a range of different connections between actors. So first starting uh, on the far left, we might think about the recent incident in Brazil as kind of an emblematic uh, example of what seems like imitation or, or at least some type of diffusion uh, mechanism where we so far don't see really any evidence of direct communication between the protesters that stormed uh, the, the Capitol on Sunday versus the protesters that stormed the US Capitol in, in 2021. Um, but there do seem to see there do seem to also be uh, important overlaps. Moving towards the right, we see a different type of relationship, which often arises in online environments, whereby uh, individuals are deliberately engaging with each other or 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 uh, engaging with each other in kind of online forums sharing uh, materials or radicalization materials in an attempt to grow the movement um, or sharing different ideas and tactics to kind of encourage uh, individuals to go out and kind of uh, conduct acts of violence or conduct acts that could broaden the movement. And then finally, on the other extreme, we see kind of more quintessential formal connections and coordinations that the project has long studied, such as explicit coordination between say, the Oath Keepers, uh, and, 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 and the three percenters or uh, keepers and the Proud Boys um, in the days preceding the January 6 attack in which they were deliberately communicating with each other in different online forums. So to kind of reference then how these different types of ties map on to the different network interactions we see among uh, 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 different entities, we wanna reference our analysis by pointing at what we think is a kind of quintessential or, or well-accepted 
uh, network analysis structure of the Islamic State. So the Islamic State structure, which we have visualized here as part of kind of this new website that Katie alluded to coming out, um, has a lot of interconnectedness or a lot of uh, centrality between the main nodes or entities within the network. And as a part of this, we find kind of a few different trends uh, within this network. So first we would note that a lot of the entities within this network, such as IS uh, or the different Al Qaeda affiliates, the Jamais, the Yama uh, or, or HDS, all have kind of an ideologically coherent end goal that they are all kind of motivated towards achieving the same um, end state. Uh, that the organizational structure is very much a hub and spoke model in that we have a central parent group um, identified here as either the, the Islamic State where we see kind of the most connections or also Al Qaeda, which is the other red uh, triangle in the, the upper left hand corner. And then we see formal affiliations or formal pledges by different affiliates around the world towards that parent organization in support of a larger common goal. As a result of this, we would tend to characterize the connections between these smaller affiliates and the Islamic State as kind of deliberate and intentional that they are often seeking ideological legitimacy or uh, explicit uh, um, uh, support from the parent organization. And that the entities within this network are finally very well uh, defined and robust organizational structures that there are often clear command and control structures even within smaller um, entities around the world, which make it very easy to kind of identify who are the main actors. So using then the Global Islamic State Network as a reference point, we, can, we turn to look at mapping the global far right. And here we find a very different type of network structure uh, emerging. So we say that one of the first differences between the network map of the, the global far right is that we find that it's actually much more insular that we see very few, that we see fewer connections between different entities, and that we attribute a lot of this insularity to the fact that oftentimes far right entities are driven by very distinct ideological claims. That is the far right groups that are operating within Europe uh, and are part of this kind of liberal or nativist or uh, pro Putin uh, philosophy are very, very different than the anti-government extremist organizations like the Oath Keepers or the Three Percenters that we see in the US. And as a result of this, we, seem to, we tend to see very few interactions between, say, the domestic groups within the United States and the uh, groups within uh, uh, Europe. Um, one of the few exceptions where we do start to see intergroup connections is with the accelerationist network, which is highlighted by the Adam Watson division uh, which is one of the, the largest nodes on here. Um, the Adam Waffen division is kind of the, the principal accelerationist group um, that has been operating since uh, about the, the mid 2010s uh, and has been able to inspire a lot of different uh, accelerationist spinoffs, both in Eastern Europe, in the UK, uh, and, and in the United States. Um, and that a lot of the connections between these accelerationist movements tends to principally take place online um, where they are sharing access to different uh, accelerationist materials such as James Mason's Siege or Julius Evola's uh, 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 philosophical work and an attempt to kind of radicalize and grow the movement and inspire um, further affiliates to, to build off. However, apart from this accelerationist network, we find that really the, the strength or the formality of these connections is very different than what uh, we see in the jihadist networks with these formal pledges of, of affiliation, that a lot of these relationships are often uh, happening either in, in online uh, discussion boards or that they're very unidirectional that they can often take the form of like plagiarism or mimicry such as the Buffalo Shooters manifest from May of this, uh, from May of last year, uh, taking large parts of the Christchurch Shooters manifest and kind of uh, presenting it as a zone or as kind of a continuation of this far right ideology. Uh, another place where we've seen a lot of informal relationships is among the the European groups, in that 
oftentimes the nature of their interactions is Hard to tell how intentional it is that they're often showing up at the same conferences together um, and it's very hard to infer how much information sharing or how much interaction is going on between them so for example um, the russian imperial movement uh, was spearheading for a very long time uh, 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 this this larger white supremacist organization called the last crusade and they invited members of far-right organizations like the NDP, the National Democratic Party of Germany, the Nordic Resistance Movement, Third Path, um, up in the, the upper uh, north quadrant. Um, but the extent to which those are really strong or formal connections seems much more in doubt compared to the jihadist uh, organizations. So. so now coming back to the question that we've been trying to answer here, how global is the global far right? Well, we, as Iris just showed you, uh, we find that it's generally based on kind of this like initial data collection and uh, you know talking through how we're thinking about these relationships, we find that uh, the, these networks tend to be more fragmented than uh, traditional kind of transnational threats like the Islamic State network. Um, we also see that these groups tend to group kind of by ideology. So the anti-government groups connect to the other anti-government groups and the white supremacists connect to the other white supremacists. And something that we're interested in looking at going forward is whether the nature of these relationships between those types of groups are different. Do the white supremacist connections look different than the anti-government connections? Um, additionally, we see that there's some transnational relationship building, as Iris discussed, the, for example, the Adam Waffen network uh, is being built, kind of connecting groups from the US uh, to those in Sweden and Germany, uh, et cetera. But a lot of this is happening mostly online. Um, and there's very few kind of like strong direct ties. It's a lot of weak informal uh, communication between these different nodes. We also assess that uh, there's kind of a low likelihood that we're going to see transnationally coordinated attacks between the different pieces of this network. Instead, uh, it seems like in, in kind of what historically has been the case here is that there's a lot of inspirational violence going on uh, where people who are followers of uh, the global far right movement might read something on a message board and be inspired to adopt those same tactics or that same ideology. Um, and so that type of violence uh, is much more likely to happen, we think, uh, than kind of a broader transnational threat that's driven by a conspiracy between these groups. So we draw two major implications here from this work we've done so far. First is that we think there's going to be some new counterterrorism challenges here. So as we've identified, there's different network structures between the global far right and uh, the kind of networks that our counterterrorism tools have been traditionally built to handle uh, in the post 9-11 world. Um, a lot of these uh, far right movements are taking advantage of these online spaces and they're very fluid. They can move between uh, these different uh, spaces. And so deplatforming is uh, going to be a challenge um, and especially these kind of fluid memberships too. Uh, people can just kind of move as one group is shut down. Um, an additional challenge that we uh, talked about in uh, a paper that's currently uh, under review uh, in r, &R so fingers crossed, um, is that these challenges are particularly difficult in democratic contexts. So if we think about the US anti-government uh, movement, uh, how do we use these kinds of counterterrorism tools to combat that threat in a, a democracy where they have protections for freedoms of speech, assembly and association, it's not illegal to carry arms, to show up to a protest in tactical gear, uh, to kind of threaten and intimidate and provoke violence. Um, it's difficult to identify those threats and then to also stop them or prosecute them if they're occurring below the level of traditional criminal behavior. The second kind of big takeaway uh, we want to emphasize here is that because of this kind of global nature, even though there's not a lot of transnational connections, there are a lot of similarities between what's happening in the United States or in Germany or in the UK. And so uh, we think there's an opportunity here for both scholars and policymakers to take a step back and kind of compare the efficacy of different approaches in each of these contexts. So for example, uh, as I started off the presentation with, some countries are prescribing these groups or banning these groups. 
is that effective? Is that something we could do in the United States or should we think about adopting other types of tools? Additionally, does deplatforming these groups work, uh, kicking them off of uh, social networks or do we need to adopt something else? So some questions here that we'll just kind of throw up to end the discussion with and happy to talk about or, or talk about other things if you all want to. Um, we have a set of empirical questions uh, that I think Iris covered really well uh, that we're really grappling with here. How do we measure these connections? What is this kind of informal relationship on this kind of larger spectrum of uh, these indirect uh, very fluid ties to these more formal alliances. Um, and then also, what is this kind of idea of organized violence? If individuals are carrying out attacks that are inspired by this movement, do they count? Or should we be thinking about something that's more organized and conspiratorial? We also think there's an important set of policy questions here. Um, for example, like how will this uh, network structure change and evolve, especially if states do start developing tools to deal with it? Uh, what lessons can the US learn, particularly from the European Union and their responses to the far right? Um, some interesting questions that kind of we've been thinking about as we wrote that piece on the anti-government movement in the United States, um, is the global far right actually more dangerous than the domestic one? And does the US import or export this type of ideology? Um, just kind of like interesting things to think about. Uh, but thank you so much for your time uh, today. We're really excited for your feedback and your thoughts. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, we'll move to a Q&A period now. Uh, so uh, one finger if you'd like to get on the queue, two if you'd like to jump in a question immediately at hand. And we traditionally give our CSEC fellows the first question. Let's see if any of them are, let's uh, go to Luis. Uh, and then just keep. Hello everyone, my name is Luis Rodriguez. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at CSEC. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I'm gonna admit that my question might come from a very teleological way of thinking, but I was wondering if what you're presenting today is just a snapshot or where the far right is right now. Um, especially if we think uh, in terms of the Islamist groups, it seems that they have had enough time to evolve in a way that has made their connections much more easier to map out. So I wonder if, especially because you have the policy question of how will the global far right adapt and evolve, if we can expect these different far right groups to be more connected in the future because they may be like too nascent yet. Thanks a lot, again. This seems to devolve uh, to me here. Uh, I think that's a really very interesting thought that is the sort of life cycle of organizations and uh, is what we're dealing with here is the relative youth. Uh, of course, many of these far right groups are not so young. Uh, they've taken off recently. If we showed you sort of, uh, well, perhaps you noticed in the sort of family tree map that they that many of the groups are older, but a lot of them sprang up really quite recently. So it could be the youth of the organization. And we have had the thought in mind of trying to compare, say, one of the other types of networks at a different stage, a different life stage, and that as they mature, will will and and actually that's a question that we don't know the answer to yet. Uh, research on the far right and particularly comparative research, both across countries, across cases, and comparing the far right to other types of uh, radical movements is still, still very young, in, in the US at least. There's been some research on it, but not an extensive amount. So I, I think that's a distinct possibility. And actually, if on our website, if you compared the kind of family tree maps that overlaid them on each other, that would show you something about the interconnectedness at different periods in time. And that would be an interesting thing to sort of pursue, especially to compare the, the maps to each other. So thank you. So I'd actually have done to not appreciate um, kind of the, the origins of that. So even after World War II within Europe, there was a large a uh, wave of kind of early proto 
like neo-Nazi groups that were kind of arising in, 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 in response to a lot of the, the reconstruction that was going on. In 1960, Robert Pugh's Minutemen form within the US, which is I think one of the oldest anti-government extremist organizations. And it's directly kind of inspired by like the birth of the John Birch Society and kind of the, the start of those right-wing ideas. Um, and then Kathleen Ballou, uh, I think does a really good job in her historical work tracing the evolution of the anti-government extremist and Christian fundamentalist uh, extremist networks within the United States starting in the 1970s, um, which I think also kind of touch on and, and spark uh, far-right movements in Europe in the 1980s as, as well. And so um, I think that there are, there are a lot of opportunities for these networks to have kind of grown and become interconnected. I think one of the distinguishing features of today's environment is really the accessibility through social media for disparate uh, parts to, to kind of talk to each other and share ideas. Hi, uh, Ken Schultz, Political Science and CSAC. Good to see you all back here. Um, so you focused in your talk on cooperative relations between these groups, but I wonder if you have anything to say about competitive relations. To what extent are they competing uh, for ide over ideology or recruits and the like? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Those certainly do exist. Um, I don't know what color are the rivalries. Orange. The orange, yeah. Orange so uh, you can see some rivalries here, uh, but there's certainly not as many as we saw uh, in, like, if I pulled up the Islamic State map. And I think that's partially two things. One is that, like, the network just looks different. Like, there's just fewer ties, so the groups just don't interact as much. Um, so those rivalries might happen, but we just don't see the opportunity for them to arise. Uh, but then also because the, the far right is so ideologically fragmented, it doesn't really make sense for like a white supremacist group to have a rivalry with like a, a US anti-government group um, because they're just kind of on different planes. They're just doing different things. Um, I think maybe there's potential for like further kind of conflict, especially as these groups become more fragmented. So you can see a couple of them here, there's splits uh, where the groups are breaking up into multiple organizations. And those are, are largely driven by ideological disagreements. So like the North Carolina chapter of the Oath Keepers leaves the Oath Keepers after January 6th. Um, and that, that kind of creates a new kind of rivalry. Um, so maybe as kind of, uh, we've talked about how this uh, network is gonna evolve over time, we might expect there to be more rivalries, but right now we don't see very many. Building off of that, the war in Ukraine seems to be like an interesting turning point because before the invasion, we saw that a lot of the like pro-Putin right-wing groups within uh, Europe were in alignment with kind of the pro-Azov uh, groups, the Azov Battalion being one of the, the major factions fighting um, on, on behalf of Ukraine. Uh, but since the invasion, we've started to see kind of, I would say, fragmentation within the European far right on whether or not they want to remain in alignment with Putin uh, or whether they don't want to side with kind of uh, Azov and, and right sector and some of the more ultra nationalist Ukrainian groups that are in there. So that's something that's still unfolding. I'll turn now to one of the online questions uh, from uh, John Davis. Does the scope of your work include uh, so-called consultants such as Steve Bannon type figures uh, who may de facto engage in communication and coordination? Particularly, I'm thinking they gave the case of Brazil and Bannon is kind of associated with the Bolsonaro government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've thought, I think this, is, this goes to the challenge of like, what is a far right group um, and what is kind of a legitimate actor here? Um, and so right now we're not mapping like Steve Bannon or Alex Jones or any of those folks, uh, but they definitely do influence the discourse uh, that the far right is having and also gives them platform and kind of amplifies their messages. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we'd love to hear thoughts on kind of how to better think about this because 
I, I think another thing that's happening is that we set up the mapping militants project with the structure uh, that corresponds to a kind of traditional militant group. So on these longer profiles, we have a state sponsorship section where if a state government provides any aid to a militant organization, we document excuse me, document it there. Uh, but what does this kind of like Steve Bannon or Alex Jones or even like Donald Trump inciting violence, where does that fit? And how do we talk about that? Great, I think uh, we had a question in the back. Is that a one finger? Or two no, it's okay, one in the back and then we'll have, go to Scott Sagan, then we'll take an online question. Uh, Tom Finger, I'm a fellow in APARC. Uh, I begin by really commending the methodology. I, I mean, it's empiricist, it's not prosecutorial. You're not attempting to prove relationships. You know, I, that is a welcome approach from my perspective. The relationship between openness and structure and purpose um, uh, is one that I, um, I suspect you've done a lot more on it. I'll tease out a little bit. Beginning with the question, are there far right organizations in any authoritarian systems? Because they're more anarchist than fascist. They're not attempting to set up a corporativist kind of government structure and control of society. It's a get away from me, government intrudes on my life, go back to some imagined time in the past of, of less interference in lives. Another question related to openness is, is it open? They behave openly because they're in an open society. They don't have to be secret. How does that relate to not having a purpose of target? undergirded by ideology that requires discipline. Uh, in the jihadist extremist, you violate discipline, you get killed. Kind of the worst you can expect out of the far right is you get expelled from an organization that is pretty nebulous kind of anyway. And how does that affect the way they interact and the nature of the threat to the system from going is, is one of the policy implications. Keep it open. Don't begin to constrain everybody's civil rights in the name of constricting the space for these groups to operate. It might be an advantage to have them operate or openly um, as, as they do. So, Thoughts on this? Um, sure. So uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think if I wrote it down correctly, your first question was about uh, the presence of the far right in authoritarian governments uh, or authoritarian states. Um, so that's an interesting question. I mean, we do see groups like the Russian Imperial Movement active in Russia. Um, and there's like this kind of interesting dynamic that's going on where uh, that group should kind of be quashed. So they're calling for a, uh, a return to like the czarist regime in Russia. Uh, so they're far right and, and, and kind of looking to restore an order that they thought you know, was better for them. Um, and presumably Putin's government could just remove them, but they haven't. And so there's like kind of some interesting theories about what that might mean for that Putin's relationship with that group, uh, but they can exist. And so I don't know, I, I think we need to collect more data to say if there are more of these movements in democracies or not. I think there's interesting challenges in democracies, which kind of goes to your second question about, is it beneficial to kind of keep these groups in the public, uh, in the public eye? Um, and I think something that we've talked about is uh, about how kind of these fluid natures of relationships this bad organizational discipline allows law enforcement to get in on the inside, I think much easier so they can uh, infiltrate these groups, they can kind of buy informants in these groups. And kind of historically, as we've looked at, like, how are these groups being taken down by law enforcement? That seems to be a major tool that's like brought success. Um, and so even recently, uh, I think like the vice president of the Oath Keepers was informing on their activities before January 6th. So I think you're right in that 
keeping these groups kind of public facing and very disorganized is certainly a benefit for law enforcement. But at the same time, it kind of allows them to exist uh, without kind of few ramifications for their behaviors. So I think there's kind of big trade offs. And I, I would add to what Katie has said that you, you raise a really interesting relationship between sort of a mass protest movement and an organized conspiratorial underground. And if you look back at say Italy in say the 1970s and the rise mostly of the leftist movement, it begins as a large scale protest movement, similar to the left in the United States. And then as time passes and more and more people drop out of the protest movement who in effect compromise, the more a radical faction becomes more radical. And similarly, they're now more at risk of uh, suppression from the state itself. And so they begin to move more and more into the underground. And at the time, many people pointed out the sorts of changes that an organization undergoes when it moves more and more deeply into an underground conspiratorial sort of mode, psychological, social, other changes. And often it does make it much more difficult to combat the group. It becomes much more lethal, much more difficult to detect. So there's certainly something to be said for openness. Also at the same time, I think, and, uh, and have argued that, I think that the arrests that have followed the January 6th assault on the Capitol have worked as an individual deterrent for a lot of people about joining these groups. It is a policy of individual level deterrence as opposed to deterrence at an organizational level has an effect on the people who are more casual followers in a very open sort of organization. I also think that the, the openness with which American groups can operate uh, in the US context is in many ways distinctive, particularly the possession and carrying of weapons, which in most other countries is simply not possible. And the fact that you can walk around carrying very high caliber weaponry in public quite legally, I think makes a big difference to the, the threat environment. And yet, if we come, then we come up against, could we have better gun control in the United States? And we're up into a, a very large political problem as to what to do with it. So I have thought a lot about that relationship between protest and organized conspiratorial violence. And my thought hasn't reached any definitive answer here, but it's, it's, it's certainly a, a really good line to pursue, I think. Yeah, um, Scott Sagan from Political Science and CSAC. Um, a quick comment, you asked the question, how should we measure the relationship or I define relationship? Um, I think you should be careful not to um, have only a clear relationship that is joint membership or joint borrowing of, of, of materials because the copycat phenomenon or what used to be called the copycat phenomenon is really worth studying even if there's no formal relationship. Um, I, I find it really disturbing to have all the links with, the, with atomic weapons or atom weapons because of uh, that may be copycat effect just I think about the relationship of attacks on nuclear power plants, for example, as a as an act of terror, even if there's no formal relationship. Uh, the question, one thing I got out of um, Stephanie Manu's book was the role that disgruntled military play in all of these. Um, do you find that that's the case across all countries? Because you would think that some countries have far less experience in the 20 years global war on, on terrorism or in, in her case, the, the war in Vietnam than in others. So there may be some differences there, or maybe that's not as important to be a ex disgruntled military person to uh, find this group appealing. So I would say based off of kind of our preliminary uh, research that we do see different kind of recruitment strands across different types of ideological. So I think anti-government extremists uh, and, and the white supremacist movement within the United States is able to attract uh, veteran fighters or individuals with law enforcement backgrounds much more easily than some of these other strands of the far right movement. And I think that that has to do with kind of this um, ideological appeal to patriotism and fighting back against tyranny and this like historical reverence for 
um, doing what's right for your country. And I think that can be a very powerful uh, recruiting message for, for that parts of the American movement. Um, outside the US, I don't see as much evidence, but I'll, I think it varies. So what I'm thinking of in particular is when you look at the accelerationists, when you look at the Adam Waffen movements, there are a lot of teenagers, right? Like the, the member or the, the head of the Fear Creek division, which was originally based out of uh, Estonia was allegedly founded by a 13 year old. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think you see similar diffusion of like teenagers and, and young people being drawn to this accelerationist helter skelter philosophy, uh, particularly coming out of the pandemic. Um, that is very unique to that strand of far right extremism. Um, so that would be something interesting to, to, to look at. Uh, but Martha, you had an example in mind. I was just thinking of a comparison with Germany where the involvement of the security services and military in the far right has also been an enormous concern. And I think another point of comparison might be Italy in the 1970s when the far right, there were a number of security services involved uh, in that. And these are militaries with very different backgrounds to the US, but it would it seems to me it would make an interesting sort of comparison to dive into that a little more deeply and 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 take the kind of historical work that she has done and, and look at other countries. And, and indeed there may be studies out there that I'm not aware of. But I think that would be a very interesting comparative approach to take there. I'm gonna bring in one of the online questions and then go to Jim. Uh, Fearon. Uh, so from Tracy Wilson online, um, in these far right groups, which are weakly connected via social media and shared ideology, have you seen any groups discuss the idea of swearing allegiance uh, in the future to a core group? Um, and also, is there evidence uh, of connections via shared funding or shared uh, tactical resources? Um, so I can try to answer. I'll also jump in. Um, there is not a lot of squaring of allegiance going on. I would say going back to the Adam Waffen kind of network, I think that's where you see most of this type of behavior, but it's, it's weird because like Iris said, there's kind of like very unidirectional relationship. So, uh, the Adam Waffen division is founded in Florida online. Um, and then affiliates pop up in Europe. And it's really unclear if they're just kind of copying the Adam Waffen brand, like they adopt the same symbols, they adopt the same name, or if they're actually working with the individuals in Florida that founded this group to kind of say, oh, we're going to be your affiliate, we're gonna be your branch in Germany, is that okay with you? Um, and we just don't see a lot of evidence of that sort of communication. Um, so it's less, it's less kind of like hub and spoke like that where, uh, versus kind of the Islamic state network that we put up before. Um, I don't know. Do no, I mean, I think I would agree with that, that it's actually really hard to infer um, to what extent there are formal affiliations because uh, on the, in these online circles, particularly in the accelerationist uh, field, people have, you know, anonymous user accounts. So if one person adopts the, the moniker of a well-known user and says, yes, we're pledging affiliation, is that actually valid or are they just playing a joke? And the, the other problem too, is that this, at least the accelerationists thrive on irony and jokes and uh, essentially making fun of, of other more formal movements or formal organizations. So it can again be hard to infer like whether they're actually sincere or whether they're just making, uh, yeah. yeah, they're trolling, they love trolling. Uh, likewise, great to see you all back. Uh, sorry about the wild weather. Um, so I, I, two things are really just clarifications and apologies if one of them I missed at the beginning. But so one is, uh, could you say a little bit about how you code, you know, you mentioned the difficulty of coding ties between groups in this far right area where, you know, it's somewhat rather less formalized than in the jihadi space where they're, you know, in the best cases or in the most clear cases, you have formal allegiances and so on. So what are your criteria? Do you look at web, what they, you know, like you must have some criteria for deciding like, oh, are they just like saying stuff that, but it doesn't mean a link. And at what point do you decide it's a link? 
And then related to that, how do you know, I mean, is there, a, is there, is there not a measurement issue here where you don't see tons of their online interaction? So how do you know like that you're coding something as, oh, these guys aren't linked, but maybe you're just not seeing a lot of, you know, less, you know, opaque interaction on non-public sites or something where it's anonymous, I don't know. The other clarifying question is like, uh, you know, far right, it's clearly, you know, okay, we know only see it, but I'd be interested to know if you have a, a definition, like what is it that makes these, well, you know, right, uh, the word right is invoking the left right spectrum. It seems that you, you're not, I mean, one thing that is very common would be white supremacist beliefs that you're saying, like you, you've been drawing a distinction between white supremacist and anti-government. You can be left anti-government, and in fact, you know, 50 years ago that we would have said the anti-government people were leftists. Is it, an, what's the additional thing? Is it the, you know, you know, yeah, like, so So, what makes, is there one thing in common here, or is it more of a, you know it when you see it? All right, I'll give it a shot. Um, okay, so the first question is how we code ties, like what are kind of the formal criteria? I think we're still honestly trying to develop that criteria in order to capture these less formal things that we're seeing. But traditionally, when we code alliances or affiliations, we usually require some sort of like demonstrated action or coordination together. Um, and so in the context of this far right movement, we would say like, oh, they're both present for to provide security at a protest. And we would say that is some form of like observed coordination. Um, additionally, this idea of shared membership. So if, uh, groups are kind of sharing members between them. We think that's some sort of relationship that you know might not exist between other groups that aren't sharing members. Um, and then we try kind of going into your second connection is we don't see a lot of these interactions. We try to figure out if these groups are regularly engaging in communication with each other. So like we do a lot of reading about like the types of telegram channels that these groups are using and if they're communicating with each other over those channels, we think that's an, an like a connection worth documenting. Um, but of course, I mean, we're, we're not in these channels. We're not, um, seeing all of these interactions. And I imagine that kind of the least formal interactions are falling through the cracks. So my guess is that, yes, we're certainly missing things, but it would kind of be biased towards finding the most formal of the informal interactions, if that makes sense, um, which might be kind of what we want to do anyway, um, but totally open to kind of talking about what that means for any sort of analysis we do with this data. Um, the question about what makes this the far right. So yes, yeah, certainly anti-government extremists on the leftist side. Um, the kind of far right element and feel free to chime in um, that I think connects all of this is like this desire to return society to a particular kind of ideal state that might've happened before. So a lot of the white supremacists are kind of ethno-nationalists. They wanna build like a white ethno state because they uh, you know, feel that uh, their white supremacist grip on society is eroding. And so there's that kind of um, strand, but then there's also these anti-government extremists that want to return society to this place where government was not so uh, like overarching and interfering in their lives. And so it's like this idea of kind of going back to the good old days that makes these the far right uh, movement. So uh, in many ways, you hit on one of, the, one of the main dilemmas we're facing. We had a set of categories for the groups we were analyzing and we, uh, had definitions for them and we knew what we were looking for in order to define the relationships among groups, although we still sometimes struggled with the distinction between allies and affiliates. When we began expanding sort of our approach, our conceptual framework to the far right, we're still struggling with well, what do we call these relationships and that's we came up with the term entanglements, uh, which we got from proton physics. Uh, uh, molecules and atoms and things that sort of behave alike without being alike. And it makes me think also of shelling and coordination problems. And th that is exactly what we struggle with. So you can imagine trying to explain to our research assistants, this is what you should be looking for when the connections among these groups are so elusive, so hard to observe, and then hard to define in terms of a concept of what we mean by these relationships. Uh, so we certainly uh, struggle with that. 
uh, the far right, yes, this kind of nostalgia for the past seems to unite them together in terms of the different strands. But I think the main point we've been trying to make is that we sort of lump and say, well, there's the far right. And so that's some sort of entity out there that we could say it's a coherent something. And instead, there are many, many, many different actors, many different centers, many different ideological variations, uh, much more fluidity. A White House advisor had described it as an extremely unstable threat environment because it shifts constantly all the time. And so it's shifting all the time and it's difficult to observe it and then difficult to come up with the kinds of categories that you want to use to analyze it. So that's exactly what we're struggling with, with extending this to the far right. In fact, on the website, we had to write an entire essay as to how we were trying to adapt our, say, conventional framework to dealing with this new form of analysis, just at least to try to explain to people how sometimes our categories simply didn't fit. But I think that's interesting in and of itself that the old categories didn't fit this new type of, and as Iris says, not entirely new in many aspects of it, but uh, still a lot of it is new. It, it's really a struggle to try to find out how to explain it, how to decide how to explain it. Of course, that's what makes it all the more interesting too. Well, we're almost out of time and we have a ton of questions. Um, so I'm with apologies to everybody on the list. I'm just gonna ask Julie and Ori to each ask their question consecutively and then one final round of comments and you guys can pick and choose <laughs> which parts of the questions you want to ask. So Julie and then Ori. Thanks so much. I'm Julie George. I'm a pre-doc fellow at CSAC and the Institute for Human-Centered AI. Um, thank you for your presentation. I found it really interesting. I wanna ask a question related to the second question of your project, which is about what lessons or uh, plans you have for government related to the far right. I'm wondering if you could maybe expand and tell us if you have any insights about the private sector when it comes to tech companies, such as Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And I know that this is a big wormhole, but you know there's been ban policies or the content moderation teams being fired. So what lessons or insights can we draw on for the private sector with tech? Thank you. Hello. I, I just wanted to ask if you've done any work relating to the Israeli far right and uh, especially ethno uh, nationalism. There's a very interesting phenomenon of convergence between the Israeli radical right and anti-Semites, which you may find interesting, and they're mirroring anti-Semitic tropes. George of Soros and stuff. Uh, so on the, the first question, um, it's been an interest to look a little bit at the role of social media and, and online platforms and how uh, these, how individuals have been using them. Um, and I think overall, there's good suggestive evidence that the trust and safety work being done by prominent social media platforms is uh, effective in terms of content moderation. I think there's pretty compelling evidence that deplatforming at least uh, limits the growth of, of a lot of these movements. Um, I think the big risk, right, is that these extremists can go to alt tech or more fringe platforms, but I have found or we've started to look at how traffic towards these uh, fringe sites is just nowhere near um, the, the kind of traffic engagement they're getting on these more mainstream sites. So I think uh, that while there are challenges to uh, regulating these, these alt tech sites, the current work being done is, is useful. Um, long term, though, of course, right, we need Section 230 reform, which <laughs> who knows what that's going to look like or when that'll come. Um, I think that there are some interesting state and local-led initiatives uh, starting to arise in the U.S., and those will be kind of interesting experiments for um, how how that uh, undertakes. But a comprehensive, uniform policy is going to be tough. So, great. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, well, Iris is the resident expert on that, so I'm. I'm 
going to leave it there uh, for the tech companies thing. I think kind of going back to our discussion about like, how do we do this in a democracy? That's also an interesting question when part of like the communication platform is regulated by a company and not by government. Um, and so how do you think about the intersection of like these freedoms of speech with content moderation and deplatforming and I think there's like a lot of interesting discussion to be had there, um, but we certainly have not figured out the answer to that yet, unfortunately. Um, the Israeli far right, I think is like on our to do, like we're really interested in learning more about that. Um, we started kind of because of the nature of our funding with the US um, and kind of built it out based on the 15 or so groups that we've identified as uh, major connections in the US or to groups in the US. Um, and so I think that's maybe in like stage two of the project is to further expand because we know for sure we're not capturing all of the kind of global pieces of the far right yet. So it'll be interesting to see how the network diagram changes once we start including those sorts of groups. Um, thank you, everyone. Great, thank you everyone for joining us and join me in thanking our speakers.